Uh, let us pray before we get any further. <clears throat> we're going to study the Bible. You know, I like teaching more than preaching. So we're gonna, I'm going to ask you all to pray. You're going to pray for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And then I'm going to pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I ask that you'll speak through your word by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. The Bible says, now please, please follow the Bible study this morning. Please. I know it's hard to stay awake. We had a long week. But just follow me, okay? Now, we see here, 99% is not what, everybody? Good enough. Now, in academia, 99%, that's very good. That's an A. Yeah, that's an A. <laughs> and we know what a percentage is. A percentage is a number, a rate, or an amount in each hundred. That makes up a percent. For example, right now in this building, we have in total 100% of the church body. Now, if I only go to this side of the church, we have how much percent? How much? 50%. Right? Percentage, amount, rate in each hundred. Now, 99% when it comes to knowing Jesus is not good enough because you have 1% left over. And that 1% Satan will use for his purpose. So this morning, our thesis of the message is that God wants all. That's it. Academia, 99%, you got an A. Christianity, that's failure. We want 100%. Does that make sense? The Bible says here, listen to Jesus. Jesus says it. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with how much? All. Is that 100 or 99%? 100, 100 right? With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, love Jesus. We're going to look at a fascinating character in the Bible I really like. His name is King Solomon. Let's look at him. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 3. Now we're going to be turning all over the Bible, especially in the Kings, going back and forth as we study the Bible this morning. 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. Are you there? 1 Kings chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 5. Go to verse 5. God wants the entire heart. 1 Kings 3 verse 5. The Bible says, In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David my father, Great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart, of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Verse 7. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a what? Little child. This is awesome. I know not how to go out or come in. Now, is that true, yes or no? Of course not. He knows how to go out and come in. The Bible is showing to us the humble character that Solomon had. Solomon says to God, he says, man, I'm but a little child. I'm in cradle roll. I don't know how to go in. I don't know how to come out. I don't know what I'm doing, God. This man starts out so so humble. The Bible says in verse 9, skip to verse 9, listen to his prayer, listen to Solomon. Give therefore thy servant an understanding, what? Heart. Heart. Watch the Bible. To judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge thy this so great a people? He says, hey, I need a good heart to judge these folks. Go to verse 12. Verse 12. Behold, I have done according to thy words. 
Lo, I, this is God, lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding, or what everybody? Heart. Heart. Phenomenal. So that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. In the Bible, God is saying to, well, Solomon asks, give me an understanding heart. God says, okay, I have given you an understanding heart. You're the wisest king ever. You're smart. Now listen to David's prayer for his son, okay? Listen to David's prayer. David says, in 1 Chronicles 29, 19, give my son Solomon a loyal, what everybody? Heart. It doesn't, he, he's not praying for Solomon to, to have riches, etc., etc. He says, I want one thing for my son, and that's to have a loyal heart to rule these people. Listen to the text. To keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes. Give him a loyal heart. 1 Kings chapter 2. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 4. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 4, and this is David again praying for his son. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 4. The Bible says, That the Lord may continue his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with, what's the next word? All, all now listen to the text, all their what? Heart. Now watch. All their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, this is God, a man on the throne of Israel. What did God just promise David? What did God just promise him as it pertains to the kingdom? Yeah, what else? Throne of Israel, well, what else? What did God just promise um, Solomon if he serves with his entire heart? Oh, no lack. Let's, let's look at it again. This is important. The Bible says, go to verse 4 again in the middle of the text. Walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul. There shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of what, everybody? Israel. God says, if your descendants... Follow me with all their heart. You will always have a relative on the throne. Wow. That's powerful. But God says that relative sitting on the throne is based on a condition. What was that condition? All of the heart. God says just follow me with your entire heart. And you will never lack a descendant on your throne. Okay, so that's David praying for uh, Solomon. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 8. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. Mm. Oh, yes. <laughs> go to verse 58. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 58. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 58. Now you just follow the Bible study. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 58. Are you awake? Only half of us awake. <laughs> Are you following the Bible this morning? Yes. Please follow the Bible. Now, in context, in chapter 8, Solomon has, uh, the building of the temple has concluded. And now Solomon, they're having this great celebration. And Solomon, in the verses we will read, he's praying a dedicatory it's a tongue twister. He's praying a prayer of dedication for this temple and for God's people. Okay? The context. This prayer of dedication. Go to verse 58. Verse 58. The Bible says that he may incline our, what everybody? Hearts. He's praying for the people. Unto him to walk in all his ways, that's God, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded of our fathers. Go to verse 61, verse 61. The Bible says, let your, what's the next word? Heart. heart. Now watch, 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 watch Solomon. Therefore be, what's the next word? Perfection. 
Is 99% of something perfection? No, you have to have 100% of a thing. He says, I, your hearts have to be perfect. He goes on to say, with the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. Let's recap so we're all together. I love teaching the Bible. I just love it. Solomon, when he prays to God and he asks for wisdom, does Solomon in his humble self, does he come to Jesus with all of his heart? Yes. Does his father, David, pray that his son Solomon follow God with all of his heart? Yes. Does God give David a promise that he will always have a descendant if they just follow God with all their heart? Yes or no? Yes. Does Solomon, at the prayer of dedication, ask the children of Israel to follow God with all of their heart perfectly? Yes or no? Yes. Solomon knows that if he follows God with all of his heart, he will be fine. The question we must uh, look at this morning is, or this statement I'm going to propose to all of us here is, God did not have Solomon's entire heart. Do you believe that? Listen to me very carefully. With all that heart business that Solomon is praying for and he's petitioning God, God did not have Solomon's entire heart when Solomon was sitting on that throne. Where did Solomon mess up first? Go to 1 Kings chapter 11. Go to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. Studying the Bible this morning. God wants the entire heart. 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 1. Are you there, family? No, 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 don't miss the Bible. Watch the drama in the Bible. I love it. <laughs> right, Dale? I love it. The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 11, But King Solomon loved many ooh, godly women. No, 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 no. He loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonianites, and Hittites, and Fresno Knights. <laughs> All these... <laughs> All these women, this man is marrying women he has no business marrying. Let me talk to you young people right here. When you get married, make sure you marry a good, converted, seventh-day Adventist. Amen. Only one person said amen in here? You awake or something? <laughs> you sleeping? <laughs> amen. amen. Do you know that mixed marriages were one of the reasons why God destroyed this earth by a flood? I preached that two weeks ago. Mixed marriages, God hates it. And he tells, and he says, hey, the Bible says that Solomon decided, man, I'm a king. I can marry who I please. He got those strange women. Now watch what happens. Verse 2. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, watch, watch what God said. You shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn away your what? Uh-oh, your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in what? Man, he loved those crazy women. I don't understand this, brother. This man had 700 wives and 300 women on the side. Come on, husbands. One wife is enough. You didn't say amen, you're smart. You didn't say you're smart. <laughs> One wife, I don't know how this brother did it. The man had a thousand women, folks. And the Bible says God told the children of Israel, don't go after strange women because they're going to turn. Did it happen to Solomon? Was his heart turned from God? Go to verse 3. Go to verse 3. The Bible says in verse 3, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his what? Wow. Mercy is right. Wow. You know women have power. Amen. Uh, <laughs> uh, you two are smart guys. You're smart guys. <laughs> the rest of you guys are in trouble. <laughs> women have power, and these women, they had so much power. This man, Solomon, he starts off so humble. God, I'm just a child. Lord, I'm in cradle roll. I don't even know how to come in and go out. 
I don't even know how to rule your people. I need wisdom, God. From being that humble, now he's chasing the gods of the Ammonites, Hittites, the Moabites, and all the websites. This guy's a mess. This guy's a mess. Those wives turn, turn. Chapter 6, 1 Kings chapter 6. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 6. I just love it. 1 Kings chapter 6. God did not have his entire heart. 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings 6. Am I talking too fast? You ready? All right, okay. 1 Kings 6. Are you there? Now here's the context. The context is the temple is complete, okay? Now listen to what the Bible says in verse 38, 1 Kings chapter 6. The Bible says, and in, don't miss this, don't miss, and in the 11th year in the month of Bull, which is the 8th month, was the house finished, the, the temple of God, Solomon's temple. Throughout all the parts thereof, and according to all the fashion of it, so was he, Solomon, so was he, how many years? Oh, oh. <laughs> according to the Bible, how long, how many years did it take for Solomon to erect that edifice? How many years? Seven years. Now, don't lose that number. Everybody shout seven. Seven. Lose that number. Seven years to build the house of the Lord. Do you know how fancy this house was? This this house was absolutely spectacular. I'm going to show you the details on the screen. Now, we do know that I, I love church history. I love history. I love the Bible. History tells us the first temple built by King Solomon had been destroyed by the Babylonians in what year, everybody? 587 B.C. We do know this. But then there was another man that came on the scene, and he, he decided to build the second temple. Does anybody recall his name? No, no, before Herod. It starts with the letter Z. Zerubbabel, somebody said it. Zerubbabel comes on the scene, and around 538 B.C., Zerubbabel's temple was constructed. Now, now listen, we got some mathematicians here. Dr. Yamada has a Ph.D. in math. How many years is this apart? Anybody know? How many years? Who said 11? <laughs> Not 11. <laughs> Can't be 11. <laughs> it's 49 years. Now listen to me very carefully. From the destruction of the first temple to the, uh, <clears throat> to the foundation of the second temple, you have 49 years. Now here's a question. Would some people still be living who are alive to see Solomon's first temple? Absolutely. Yes. Yes, that's only 49 years. Let's say if you, if, if you saw Solomon's temple and you were 10, 49 years later, how old would you be? 59. You got a lot of people here older than 59. Now, I didn't point, I didn't call any names. I'm going to say you got a lot of folk here older. <laughs> but it's a blessing. Any year of life is a blessing. Amen? So hey, look, you got 49-year gap. So there were some folk who were alive to see the first temple. Now listen, don't miss the Bible. Listen to how. The old folks reacted to Zerubbabel's temple in comparison to Solomon's. Watch what the Bible says. The Bible says in Ezra, Many of the priests and Levites and heads of the fathers' houses, old men who had seen the what, everybody? First temple. Watch how they, they wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple, Zerubbabel's, was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for what? The folk that shouted aloud for joy, this was the younger generation who did not see the first temple. Because you're just happy just to have a house of God. But the Bible says the older saints, the older people that saw the foundation of the second temple after seeing the first, the Bible says they broke down. They started crying. The Bible says they wept aloud. 
Have you ever cried so hard that you had no, you no longer had tears? You ever experienced that before? You just cry, you just so, so hurt. That's what happened to those guys that saw the foundation of the second temple. This is how grand Solomon's first temple was. Awesome in splendor. So the old folks that saw the first temple broke down in tears when they saw the second temple. Pale in comparison. So what was the first temple like? That's a good question. So, so what did the first temple look like? The Bible says, don't miss it. Ah, it's phenomenal. The Bible says, well, first of all, I want to ask you a question. The, the mosaic sanctuary, you know that sanctuary? The temple is the permanent structure. The, the, the sanctuary was portable. In that sanctuary, how many candlesticks did you have in that sanctuary of Moses? Uh, yeah, you, well, you had a candelabra with the seven branch candlesticks. How many tables of showbread did you have? One. How many labors did you have? You know, all that, all that stuff changed in Solomon's temple. When the priest entered Mo, the Mosaic temple, when he, when he entered the holy place, on the left side was the golden candlestick, just one with seven branches. Now listen to how awesome Solomon's temple was. The Bible says, and he made how many? Ten. Ten candlesticks of gold according to their form and set them in the temple, five on the right hand and five on the left. This brother went overboard. Not even necessary. He has ten candlesticks in the temple. Moses just had one. Awesome. All pure gold. The Bible goes on to say by the table of shoe bread. He made also how many tables? Ten tables and placed them in the temple, five on the right side and five on the left. And he made an hundred basins of gold. The priests in the Mosaic Temple, only one laver. Man, you had a hundred of them. They had wheels on them. You could move them. Elaborate. Awesome. Goes on to say in 1 Kings 6.21, Solomon covered the inside of the temple with pure gold. And he extended gold chains across the front of the inner sanctuary. This place, this temple, awesome. You would be in awe if you stepped foot in the sanctuary. Now this is the best rendition I could find on the internet. Can you imagine the priest entering the holy place and this is what you see? Do you know how powerful this is? You have five, and they stay lit all day long. You have five candlesticks, uh, candelabras on this side, five on this side. You're in this structure covered completely with gold, and the light is just bouncing off of those golden walls. You know how beautiful that is? Gorgeous. Where did all the gold come from? We'll see. Gorgeous. This right here was the first temple. Question. See if you remember. Awesome. How many years, this awesome structure, did it take Solomon's team, how many years did it take his team to construct the first temple? How many years? Seven, Seven years. Seven years. That's a long time. Now watch the Bible. Do not miss this verse. Chapter 7, 1 Kings chapter 7. 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 1. Are you there? Amen. The Bible says, but the Bible says, verse 1, but Solomon was building his own house. How long? <laughs> and he finished all his house. You missed that. Why is that verse so significant? As it pertains to God having Solomon's entire heart. You know why it's so significant? This brother Solomon, he decides, you know what? It's going to take seven years, seven years to construct this. The house of the Lord will take seven years, but when it comes to my house, I'm going to add six years to it. 
In other words, Solomon cared more about his plush palace than the house of God. It took 13 years because he was so vain and so into himself. 13, almost twice as long to build his palace than he took for building the house of the Lord. Oh, <laughs> Luella said he had to have all those rooms for his wives. <laughs> well, maybe so. <laughs> the point is, this brother was really into his house. Now, we like nice homes. Isn't that right? We like nice homes. Let's get practical. Does anybody know this is a nice house in France? On friend, can you imagine you waking up in your morning devotion? You see this? Can you imagine that? You know whose house this is? His name is George Clooney. That's his house. That's nice. That's really nice. Yeah, it's in Italy. Yeah, Italy. That's in Italy. You know whose uh, mansion this is? This is uh, a boxer named um, um, uh, Pacquiao. This is his house. It's in L.A. somewhere. Very, very nice. And then, does anybody know about the Mysore Palace? This is awesome. This is a dynasty in, in West India in 1399. I can't even pronounce the name of the dynasty. But this is the history. Way back in 1399, this was erected. Awesome and splendor. This is how it looks at nighttime. Can you imagine walking down this hallway? Can you Look at how elaborate this is. You're just walking down this hallway just to take a shower or something. <laughs> My hallway looks nothing like that at home. <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> Not even close to that. But here you have the, all these awesome, awesome mansions. This stuff could not touch Solomon's palace. Couldn't touch it. Do you want to see the details of Solomon's palace? Do you want to read about it? Only two people? Well, we're going to read about it anyway. <laughs> Only two people want to read. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 10. Only two people. Oh, 1 Kings chapter 10. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 10. 1 Kings chapter 10. Listen to the splendor of this man's palace. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 10, go to verse 14. Are you there? Go to verse 14. The Bible says in 1 Kings 10 verse 14, Now the weight of of gold that Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. You know how much gold that is? By the way, that number is 666. Oh, that's a whole nother sermon. This, mother, this brother has the, they have the number of the, the man of sin. Here he has all this gold. Now watch in verse 15. Besides that, he had of the merchantmen and of the traffic of the, the spice merchants and of all the kings of Arabia and of the governors of the country. And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went to one target. And he made 300 shields of beaten. Isn't that shields are made of beaten gold, folks? Three pound of gold went to one shield, and the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, now listen to this. The king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best what? Now, now wait a minute, folks. Wait a minute. If you have a throne, do you know how beautiful ivory is? I mean, if you have a throne made out of ivory, what are you doing putting gold? I guess the ivory is not good enough. When you have that much cash flow, oh, just cover the ivory with gold. What? <laughs> makes no sense. The Bible says in verse 19, the, listen to his throne. The throne had six steps, and the top of the throne was round behind, and there were stays on each side of the place of the seat. Listen to this. And two lions stood beside the stays. Verse 12, verse 20. And 12 lions stood there on one side and on the other upon six steps. There was not the light made in any kingdom. And then other, you know how powerful this is? The man had how many steps to his throne? 
Every single step on each side, you had golden lions. You had 12 of them. Six steps just to get to the top of the throne. All gold. The Bible goes on to say in verse, verse 21, And all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Listen to the stuff. None were of what? Now he said, man, forget that cheap stuff. I'm not dealing with silver. You better give me that um, 24 carat. Gold. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. Verse 22. This is just so awesome to me. For the king had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. He had his own navy, folks. Now listen to this. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. You know how awesome that is? You know how powerful that is? How much money this man had? The Bible says this man had apes and peacocks as pets. You know what kind of pets we have? We have like cats and dogs. All right, all right. We have Solomon said, "Forget that. You better bring me some apes and peacocks." Monkey, hey, monkey too. That's hey. So, the point is, you know what the point is? Monkeys, apes, peacocks. You know what the point is? The point is Solomon had his own private zoo. Can you imagine going in your backyard and you have giraffes everywhere and apes swinging on the trees? That's awesome. This man had so much because it took 13 years to build it. 13 years to build it. Wow. This brother was lost in vanity. But you know what? God was so good. God was so good. You know when God finally had all of Solomon's heart? It was toward the end of Solomon's life. Before then, the Bible says, Solomon wrote this when he was older. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanity, how much? All. all is vanity. He got to the end of his life and he says, you know what? All this that I have amassed for 13 plus years, this fancy mansion, all this gold and silver and apes and monkeys and peacocks, all of this stuff means nothing without Jesus. Doesn't mean anything. Nothing. And then he says, last verse, he says this. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of what? man. Solomon says, at the end of the day, it's not about accumulating stuff. At the end of the day, it's all about fearing God, which means reverence him. In other words, Solomon is saying, have a relationship with Jesus. Give Jesus your old, whole heart. And you don't have to wait until you're old to give Jesus your heart. You can give Jesus your heart today, entirely. Last quote, and then we'll pray. Last quote from Ellen White. She says, No outward observances can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. But no man can empty himself of self. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. Then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my what? Heart. God, take my heart, Lord. Then she says, for I cannot give it. You can't even, the, the nature that we have, we're so messed up and deep in sin, we can't, we can't even give God our hearts. God, take it. Take my heart, Lord. I'm a mess. I cannot give it. Then she closes. It is thy property. Lord, keep it pure. For I cannot keep it for thee. 
save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchrist-like self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. Wow. Wow. She says, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, she says, save me, God. Save me, dear God, in spite of my unchrist like self. God, I'm, real, I'm in real bad shape, Jesus. I'm in real bad shape. But God, in spite of it, Lord, I, I want you to save me. I need you to take my heart because I cannot give it. My appeal this morning to my church family, give Jesus your entire heart. He wants it. The entire heart. Why? Because 99% will never work. All heads bowed and eyes closed. My first appeal this morning. We're just being honest with Jesus this morning. You know, I don't know your situation, but you know. You know that God does not have 100%. You know that. And you're saying to Jesus this morning, oh, Jesus, I am so unchrist like I need help. I'm a mess. Save me, God, in spite of my unchrist like self. God does not have 100%, but you're saying to Jesus this morning, God, take my heart. I give you my heart this morning. Take it, Lord. I cannot give it. If you know that God does not have 100%, you are holding on to something today. You are holding on to something, and it's sinful. And you need help from the Holy Ghost to sever that thing from your life. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Keep them up. Keep them up. I want to see who I'm praying for. Keep them up. Something. I got something. The hands down. My second appeal. You have backslidden from God. There's a time you were, you were in love with Jesus, but you have strayed from God. And you want to come back to Jesus today. If you have backslidden from God, raise your hand. Keep your hands up. You can come back today and keep your hands up. Hands down. And we're going to kneel together. As we kneel together, I'm going to give you all time to pray. You tell Jesus exactly what's on your heart. I'll give you a few moments to pray, and then I'll close out. Let's kneel together. Father in heaven, Lord, we look at the life of Solomon. This brother was so vain. He spent more time on his house than the house of the Lord. But at the end of his life, he said it's all vanity. It's, it's, it means nothing. Nothing. He then says, fear God. This is the whole duty of man. Father, I want to pray for those who raised their hands at the first appeal saying, Lord Jesus, I am so unchrist like There is something that I'm holding on to. You do not have my full heart. It's not 100%. You don't have it. So, Father, for, the, for your children, for being so honest, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you will give them the boldness, give them the Holy Spirit to sever whatever that thing might be, to sever it, to cut it off. And, Lord, you will give them the power. You just love us so much. For those raise their hands, second appeal, saying, Lord, I have backslidden. I need to come to Jesus today. Lord, we're so thankful for life because where there's life, there is hope. Anyone, no matter what the condition, can come to Jesus now. So, Father, for those who raise their hands saying, oh, Jesus, I've backslidden. God, please manifest your power to each and every one of them. 
And may they never get discouraged but hold on to Jesus for their life. Oh God, the Bible says you desire that all men be saved. Continue to be with us throughout the duration of this Sabbath. And may all of us here, from the pastor to the layman, may we all fall deeper and deeper in love with Jesus on a daily basis. Why? Because 99% will never work with Jesus. Lord, you want the whole heart. Lord, we love you. Thank you for being so patient with us. Thank you so much. Your mercy is everlasting and endures, endures forever. Bless your children in a powerful way. Lord, I just want to thank you personally for not leaving me alone behind this pulpit. Preaching is not a game. It's not a joke. Serious business. Lord, I just want to thank you. God, may we all remain faithful. In Jesus' name I pray, let every child of the King say it. Amen. Amen.